uh, our next speaker is from NASA, which is just totally cool. Um, among the many positions at NASA, uh, he's been a flight controller in Houston for space shuttle missions, also totally cool. Uh, but today, more recently, uh, Jay's founded and leads the user-centered technology group at NASA, um, the Ames Research Center, which is down the peninsula a little ways. Um, the the um, user-centered technology group designs and builds software to support NASA, NASA missions. And he's going to be telling us about the role of user beliefs and adoption of new software, Jay. Thanks for that low billing that I have to live up to and how cool NASA is, okay. <laughs> so uh, really, uh, this is just about kind of, kind of my utter shock at times between telling users what we were going to build for them and then how they react to it. So let me set the stage here. Uh, and this, is our, this is our community. Uh, I kind of think of it as a small town in terms of the way communication works. Everybody knows everybody. There are no secrets in mission control. Um, try to keep one. Might last five minutes. Uh, bottom left is mission control the way it was during the heyday of Apollo, and on the upper right is the way it is now. Uh, it really hasn't functionally changed a whole heck of a lot. Uh, and think of each one of those consoles as its own little discipline, okay? So a little small town within a small town. Uh, so the word would travel fastest within a discipline, and then it would travel across the whole control center. And this, this gets to the story I'm going to tell of the software we are trying to build for these guys. Uh, and another interesting, so I was one of these guys, now I'm coming back trying to sell them on a vision of how to do software and how to fly things a little bit differently. This is our team, uh, much more conventional design. Nothing new to you guys, very new to a requirements-driven engineering organization to even think in terms of user experience. Uh, and a total shock when I, when I first proposed it. This is the motivation. This is really why we come to work in the morning. <laughs> and I, I love the uh, reality meets sci-fi there. Think of what Tracy Caldwell's thinking as she looks out that window. Anyway, so what we're doing, uh, so I've got this idea for software. We're going to build this new architecture for mission control. Uh, these displays are all going to be user controllable uh, or, or user composable. We're going, to, we're going to empower these flight controllers to build their own displays. Uh, and then they have to do this safely in a flight operations environment, right? So you don't want to take off in a plane where somebody's just put the display together five minutes ago and the crew hasn't been certified and trained on that, right? That's the kind of thing that probably make you take the bus. Uh, so we have to kind of walk that tightrope, and to get this funded, I have to create some degree of hype and excitement around it, otherwise I can't build it at all. Now that's internal funding, internal to my own organization. Okay, so uh, you've got this blank screen, uh, and, and I find that it, we can get up and talk about it, I can talk about what I'm going to do till I am blue in the face, okay, and there's a limit to the power of words. Uh, I really cre create some mythic ritual to get people inside of NASA to understand this stuff better, right? So I'm limited to talk and PowerPoint, at least at first. And what I find is people project their own expectations onto what I'm saying. If you want to think about this outside of NASA, uh, think about any politician. Think about a politician and they are promising things. And you can get into office, I think, do exactly what you promised. And there will be people who listened to you and voted for you who are completely shocked. They don't get it because you know, they had a mental model of what they were expecting. Doesn't matter what you said. Okay, so these worlds have to come together somehow. So you're gonna fill in that blank screen. How do you do it? What level of fidelity do you do it? Well, you know, we tend to start at very low fidelity with sticky notes and we get people involved. Uh, and there's our mythic ritual that actually gets people understanding what that software is. And then they own that design and they are part of that design. Uh, but it's pretty low fidelity. It still leaves a lot of room for interpretation, and it reaches a reasonably small group, which is that group of people we're designing with, and then the word spreads from there. What happens when word spreads beyond a core group of people as it goes through more and more people? Well, it gets modified, shall we say. Okay, you can go higher fidelity, uh, and that also has its pitfalls, because if, if you get up and show a prototype, at least in my experience, that looks finished, then people think it is the software. Uh, and they said, why do you need money? It looks to me like your software is finished. Okay, we've gotten that too. Uh, so, so pick your level of fidelity and pick your pitfalls there. We do not have the luxury of 
putting something out in a beta environment like you can on the web that is partially finished and throwing it in mission control and letting people use it because then you're back to your airplane model where people are going to be taking the bus, right? It's not safe. Not in our world. So, uh, you know, we all have a set of beliefs, a mental model, a narrative that we live by that makes the world work for us, wishes, desires, superstitions. You guys, you're designers, you know this story, okay? So, uh, you know, I can get up there, like I said, and say whatever I want, and I am just utterly amazed at the way it may come out on the other side. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, you don't necessarily know this. You're talking, people are nodding their heads, they're asking questions, it seems like they understand. And it's only through the small town gossip network later that we may find out that somebody completely misunderstood what we were saying. Okay, so picture this, you've been through, you've sold this software, you've gotten a core group of people excited about it, you have a core group of users, and this is our world, and we actually, through our development period, did deploy every six weeks uh, into a test facility. Uh, so think of that as kind of a limited beta. But that test facility isn't something very many people use. Only a core group of users ever use that. So we come out into the world uh, and, and we say, okay, we're going to expand our user group to a broader audience and we're going to do a test. Uh, and we were pretty excited about this first test. We went to Houston, we got the software out there, and I would say it was like, it was like that. Uh, <laughs> I said it was like jumping into Lake Tahoe, uh, the kind of response we got. And I realized uh, that these guys had no mental model for kind of a continuous agile delivery mindset. You know, the Google Docs, they put it out on the web, it's going to be improved over time. Their model was, we put out a set of specs to a contractor, uh, the contractor delivers something and then it's done. So they were completely horrified because they're thinking this software that we're thinking is just getting tested is actually finished and that's all they'll get. So had we understood that mental model going in, I think we probably could have reduced that shock, made it more like jumping into uh, you know, the Pacific and Hawaii instead of into an iceberg. Okay, so what, so what are your options? You know, deploy early and often is kind of the mantra around here. Um, and and I, think, I think that can work in our environment in some instances. Um, as I said, we don't have the, we can leave it in beta for a couple of years luxury, we have to compete with, the, with this existing mental model and teach them a new one that just because it's out there doesn't mean it's finished. So they have to understand it. And I would say out in the world, I mean, there's a lot of web-based software, right, that evolves over several years. Try doing that uh, with a set-top box. Uh, go develop a set-top box that's maybe 25% finished, put it out there, try and sell it, and see what kind of reaction you get. My guess is it would be very negative. Um, <laughs> so this deploy early and often works in some instances but not others. Uh, you know, my current answer to this is to be constantly educating people. I just find uh, as people talk and give their opinions, we have to get out there and try and give real information and say this is what this software is actually doing as we get to the point where it's certified and in mission control so everybody can see it for themselves. Um, constantly engage the users. A key here that has kept us going is being People, when they see the rate of progress, they come around. So they jump into Lake Tahoe, they're in complete shock, but six weeks later, they see another delivery, they see the rate of progress, and the whole world changes for us. So it's very important for them to see that their wishes can actually be responded to very quickly. Because they're used to it being, you know, taking a very long time to see change happen. Okay, that's most of the software story. I had a couple other little tidbits I wanted to show you guys. Um, beware of promises and make sure that your team knows every promise you make. Ideally, they should be part of it and own it. But if you get out and make a promise and your team is not fully aware or understanding, uh, you do that at your own risk. Automate or socialize. You know, stand up there and say, okay, we're going to have uh, X percentage of code coverage on unit tests. Nothing would happen. Um, I'd get up there and say, here, you know, here's any, take any team process. Uh, and we'd be scratching our heads and say, oh, so how do we do this? So automation, well, okay, if you automate it, it just happens. Uh, our build process is automated. Nobody has to worry about that. Uh, socialization seems to be the other cure. If the whole team is expecting something and people are talking about it, it seems to happen. If you leave a process, at least in my experience, uh, out on the edge for people to just do it may or may not happen. Probably not because people are too busy and I would love after this to hear other people's experience with that. 
Uh, another little pitfall I've learned as a manager, somebody from uh, headquarters will come and say, oh, I like this idea of user experience thing. Can you make this thing better? And we, we uh, very excitedly go into a project. Um, but then I found that manager had, of course, no idea what it actually means to do user experience. And that can become very shocking along the way. Oh, you actually do talk to customers. You engage in customers. You're going to come back with customer feedback, which people may not like. Okay, and last but not least, how close do you get to your customer? Um, our customer is internal. So I think on the left, you know, this can happen. Um, it's not really a good thing, <laughs> at least in my experience. But then that war footing on the right is also probably not where you want it. Uh, during Apollo, when we were going to the moon, uh, you know, you had quality assurance people who were responsible for making sure that the lunar module, for example, was actually done to spec and was going to safely land astronauts on the moon. There were actually limits on how close those QA people could get to the people building the lunar module, right? You don't necessarily want those guys going out to lunch together because then they're going to be buddies and they might let something slip through the cracks. So anyway, that is, that is our world. <laughs>